Welcome back to the Religions of the Ancient Mediterranean podcast. I'm Phil Harland. I'm a professor at York University in Toronto. We're continuing with the series, Paul and His Communities, Series 1. And today we're going on to Episode 3, which continues on with the discussion of Paul and the Christians at Thessalonica. In the previous episode, we looked at the question of what was the situation among the followers of Jesus at Thessalonica in Macedonia, and considered two main aspects of what they were going through. On the one hand, they were faced with afflictions, namely social dislocation. They no longer worshipped the Greek and Roman gods, and their neighbors in Thessalonica looked down upon them at times, and some of their neighbors were also harassing them in some ways, socially, perhaps ostracizing them. On the other hand, they were also struggling with the fact that Paul's promise that Jesus, the Son of God, would come and rescue them from the coming wrath had been delayed in a way they were not expecting. And since this delay had happened, their own friends and family, other followers of Jesus, had passed away. And so these Christians at Thessalonica were also depressed. Paul was dealing with dislocated and depressed followers of Jesus at Thessalonica. And today we go on to see how he responds to that situation in his letter, known as 1 Thessalonians in the New Testament. Here we'll see in this episode how Paul tries to build up their identity and tries to comfort the Christians at Thessalonica, in part by using familial language, language using the analogy of the family, in order to describe not only how the Thessalonican Christians relate to one another, but also how Paul, as nurse and father, as we'll see, relates to these Christians at Thessalonica. We'll also be considering how Paul tries to address the apocalyptic expectation that these followers of Jesus had. They got it from him. And so he tries to flesh out more fully and clearly his own view regarding the expected end. As a result, we get an important glimpse into the apocalyptic worldview of this particular Judean. Let's go on to Paul's response to this situation. And in the process of talking about Paul's response, we'll get more insight into the various cultural sides to Paul that we've been talking about. His Jewish side, his Greek side, his Roman side. First of all, let's talk about a Greco-Roman side to this letter, namely the rhetoric. What are the three types of rhetoric, and which of the three might you categorize the letter to the Christians at Thessalonica in? So, judicial, the type of rhetoric you get in the court case. What was the second one? Deliberative, Deliberative, the type of rhetoric you get in the civic, the body of citizens gathered together to deliberate about what to do in the future. And then, demonstrative demonstrative or epideictic, which is the setting of the festival usually, but it has to do with praising someone or blaming someone. There's hardly a place in 1 Thessalonians where Paul says, You guys need to change the way you're thinking about this and you need to do something. But the whole thing is praising, right from beginning to end almost. But let's remind ourselves and look at the first chapter where it's jam-packed full of praise. Not every letter is. Not every letter Paul writes to Christians is praising like this. In fact, next week you'll read one where it's quite the opposite. It starts off on Galatians, you already read, where it's straight into you guys are terrible and you should start changing the way you're doing stuff. Instead here you have, we give thanks, which you expect in a letter, to God always for you. And then he goes on. Look at chapter 1, verse 6 and following. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction, with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. That's quite the praise. For not only that has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, But your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. We don't need to tell you anything you're doing wrong. You don't need to deliberate about anything to contrast it to deliberative rhetoric here, right? It's all about how wonderful they are. This is praise rhetoric, demonstrative rhetoric. So the overall type of Greco-Roman rhetoric Paul is using here is demonstrative. And that shows you that Paul is trained in these styles of argumentation that are common to intellectuals in the Greco-Roman world. Let's get into how he uses that rhetoric in order to comfort the Christians. That's my main take on the whole letter to the Thessalonians. It's a praising letter that is attempting to address those two main issues, 
that we've raised. The issue of the afflictions and the issue of some of the members of the group dying and the other members not knowing what this means. These two things are on Paul's mind throughout, I would suggest to you. And his overall tone and his approach to arguing the point, including his praising language, is centered around comforting and trying to make the Christians feel more comfortable and safe again. They're feeling disjointed. People in Thessalonica are looking down on them, some of the people, and are no longer accepting them because they've rejected the gods of these other people. And they're feeling socially disjointed. Not only that, but they're feeling depressed because some of their fellow followers of Jesus are dying. Depressed and socially dislocated people. Paul responds to this with something that is appropriate to that situation. First of all, let's look at the tone. This is, remember, this is our first earliest example of early Christianity. So something you take for granted, you need to be reminded of. And that is the idea of calling the members of the Jesus group brothers don't take for granted as, oh yeah, that's what everyone does. No, we're seeing it for the first time here. We're seeing for the first time an example of a member of the Jesus movement calling other members of the Jesus movement brother. And they don't mean literal brother. They're talking about brothers and using familial language in order to emphasize their belonging together. We are like a family is what you're saying when you call people brothers. We're deadened to that sense because we know within Christianity there's been 2,000 years of that being common and it doesn't mean anything anymore, right? But this is Paul writing to people that are feeling socially dislocated and using the language of family to describe them. This is comforting them. This is giving them a sense of you're socially dislocated in relation to outsiders, but this is a way in which you are socially located together, bound together. And by repeatedly calling them brothers, he's emphasizing that familial language and the familial togetherness of the followers of Jesus. So the tone Paul uses in writing to them includes using familial language of brothers. But there's other familial language that also draws Paul into relationship with them in a familial way. Look in chapter 2, verses 7 and following, where once again we have further evidence that Paul's response to the situation of socially dislocated Christians who are feeling depressed is to bring them together and use familial language to bring them together and bring, bring, use familial language to express Paul's relationship to them. And he uses this interesting analogy of being a nurse. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse taking care of her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the good news of God, but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. He's picturing himself as a mother taking care of a newborn baby here. That the Thessalonians are like the baby and he's the mother. Interesting familial language here that is responding to a concrete situation. Now we can place this use of familial language and the overall tone of Paul's approach to teaching his students. Let's look at another philosopher who has students and what he says about how to approach Students who are in dire circumstances. Here he is writing about how a teacher should approach stu- teaching students who are in dire circumstances. And he gives an example that sounds an awful lot like what Paul is doing. So this is Plutarch writing about this sort of approach to teaching students. And he's, he's also talking about the practice of talking frankly. Let me be frank. That idea of frank, not f- some guy named Frank. Let me be frank. Let me be frank with you and tell you as it is, right? This is the ideal of most philosophers in the Greco-Roman world. Tell it like it is. Don't hold back from what you are trying to get across. That's the ideal among philosophers. However, Plutarch says, but in circumstances where your students are in dire straits, where they're faced with afflictions, you could say, you need to be more gentle. This is what he says about not doing the typical frankness when people are in dire circumstances. Under such conditions then, the very circumstances in which the unfortunate find themselves leave no room for frank speaking and sententious saws, sawing away at their problems. But they do do require gentle usage and help. When children fall down, the nurses do not rush up to them and berate them, 
But they take them up, wash them, and straighten their clothes. And after all of this is done, then they rebuke them and punish them. Be gentle with the children. Is the image nurses taking care of the children? Is the image Plutarch uses of how to approach students in dire circumstances? It's also the approach, clearly, that Paul uses in teaching his students. It's totally different teaching. He's taught them, yes. That's, we're not saying the teaching is the same, are we? But we're saying the technique in a teacher dealing with his students is similar. Again, and we're not talking about direct relation, are we? We're not saying that Paul read Plutarch and said, hey, I'm going to do that. We're talking about general discussions that are common in the intellectual world of philosophers that Paul is familiar with and influenced by. And that Plutarch's influenced by them and Paul's influenced by them. It's just part of a broader cultural discourse that's going on. And that's a common sort of perception among students of history at the early stages of studying history for the first time or second or third time, different courses, is this more simplistic view of history where you think things are about influences or about this person copied that person. Sometimes it's the case, but usually it's about broader cultural practices that you're talking about in history and how two different people are part of that broader cultural context and that that's how they share the same ideas as opposed to that one borrowed from the other. But sometimes the borrowing happens. It's not totally uh, impossible. But more often, it's not direct borrowing. So we've got one aspect of about how Paul ad- addresses this situation and comforts the Christians by using familial language, including the mother language, also father language, by the way. I won't get into that example, but there's another passage in that same chapter where Paul calls himself a father in relation to them. Let's go on to this next aspect of how he addresses these depressed Christians facing social harassment. And that is, he puts himself up as an example. This is very typical of Paul and of other teachers in the Greco-Roman world. That when they teach something, they say, look at me and do what I do. Sure, other people will criticize them, say, you're not doing what you said you were going to do, etc. But they, they have this idea of me, the teacher, as the example to follow and and imitate me. And we have this throughout Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, but also in his other letters. But it was right in that first chapter he already began it. With his praising language, he praises them because he's like himself. (laughs) Imitate me. You are imitating me. You're wonderful. You're just like me. I like you. This is the, the approach he takes, right? And it's obviously bringing them closer to him and identifying with them, etc., in the process. But that was in chapter 1, verses 6 and following. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. He also puts the Lord as a person to imitate. For you received the word in much affliction, with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, etc. Imitate me. You'll see that in other places in the letter and in other of Paul's letters. Putting himself forward as an example to follow. This is also typical of other teachers among the philosophers of the Greco-Roman world. And Seneca is talking about the technique of how to teach well and using imitation as the primary means of teaching your students philosophy. So Seneca is the guy in the first century, philosopher. This is what he says. You must go to the scene of the action. First, because men put more faith in their eyes than in their ears. And second, because the way is long if one follows precepts, but short and helpful if one follows patterns going to go through several different philosophers now and how they uh, put themselves as examples to follow. Clenthes could not have been the express image of Zeno if he had merely heard his lectures. He shared in his life, saw into his hidden purposes, and watched him to see whether he lived according to his own rules. Plato, Aristotle, and the whole throng of sages who were destined to go each his different way derive more benefit from the character than from the words of Socrates. It was not the classroom of Epicurus, but living together under the same roof that made great men out of Metrodorus and Marcus and Polyanus. Therefore, I summon you, not merely that you may derive benefit, but that you may confer benefit, for we can assist each other greatly. One teacher talking to another teacher about techniques of imitation and of putting yourself as an example to follow 
Now, all of this, this understanding of Paul within the context of Greco-Roman philosophy, you can read more about in the scholar that has influenced the way I'm talking about it here. And that is Abraham Malherby has extensively written on placing Paul within the context of Greco-Roman philosophy, including 1 Thessalonians. And so he's a place to go if you want to read more about that sort of way of approaching uh, studying Paul. But all of this in our argument here is part of how Paul is responding to the situation in order to try and comfort and influence the Christians there. Something that comes up just momentarily but seems to be very important is in chapter 4, this next issue of the relationship with outsiders. So another way that Paul tries to address the situation of social harassment where outsiders, people in Thessalonica, are looking down upon these followers of Jesus now. These followers of Jesus used to worship the Greek and Roman gods with their neighbors. Now they're not. This has led to social harassment, as we've already seen. And one of the ways that Paul tries to alleviate the tensions between the non-Christian Thessalonicans and these followers of Jesus is for them to be concerned about how outsiders perceive them. Let's look at chapter 4 to see the evidence I'm talking about. It's just in one sentence. But in this case, one sentence has, says a whole lot. It's right in the Paranesis section that we've read. And we talked about it briefly in connection with working with your own hands. And it was evidence that the Christians work with their own hands. But look at the rest of the material. Here, Paul is summarizing the most important things about what they need to do. He's saying, love the brothers. And you're already doing it. Loving the brothers is something he always emphasizes as important. He then goes on to other things that are really important. They're in one sentence, but they're really important. We exhort you, brothers, to do so more and more, to aspire to live quietly, live quiet lives that are not drawing attention to yourselves, to mind your own affairs. Don't be a busybody interfering in the lives of other people. And to work with your own hands as we charged you. Look at the reason he's saying those things. So he's saying to live quietly, keep to yourself a little bit more, and stop interfering in people's lives. Maybe that's what was going on. They were a bit too upfront in their relationship to non-Christian Thessalonicans, and this was creating tensions, exacerbating the afflictions and creating more tensions between outsiders. And here he's saying, live more quietly, mind your own affairs, and stop bugging people outside of your group. And look at the reason he gives in verse 12. So we're in chapter 4, verse 12. So that you may command the respect of outsiders and be dependent on nobody. The reason that they're supposed to live quietly and mind their own affairs is so that outsiders will respect them. So another strategy Paul has in addressing this situation of Christians being harassed is to say, find out ways to lessen the harassment. Find ways of being respected instead of being antagonistic or in conflict with outsiders. Find ways of being less so. All of this is part of Paul's response to these specific things that are going on at Thessalonica. Let's just introduce something that we're going to extensively discuss in the tutorials next week, and I've got 10 minutes to talk about it right now and introduce the ideas to you. And that is a Jewish, a Judean side of Paul, no doubt, is his apocalyptic worldview. So we need to talk a little bit about this Jewish side of Paul because it's at the heart of his whole teaching. We've already summarized that, that early sentence in 1 Thessalonians, summarized the teaching. And what is part of that teaching? What is sort of the culmination of the teaching? The wrath to come. Apocalypticism is at the heart of Paul's teaching. The whole Jesus movement, at least the earliest versions of it that we have evidence of, are apocalyptic. So we need to know a bit about what apocalypticism is in order to understand Christianity at all. And especially to understand Paul, we need to know what apocalypticism is. So let me introduce to you, first of all, the overall scenario of what a, the apocalyptic worldview is. I may have mentioned this briefly before, but let me remind you and, and, and flesh it out a little bit. The apocalyptic scenario that is held by some Judeans, including Paul, is like this. This is how an apocalyptic thinker thinks, what I'm about to say. I am living, we are living, in an evil age, dominated by evil powers. This situation of living in an evil age dominated by evil powers is not the way it will ultimately be. God, who is good, has a plan 
to put an end to evil. Even this present evil age is somehow part of that plan. Predeterminism is an important aspect of the apocalyptic worldview. This idea of God having a plan that will unfold. It's set up ahead of time. There's a plan. Predeterminism. During the present evil age, there's a constant battle going on between good and evil. This can be between good and evil individuals in Thessalonica, between, in Paul's view, the followers of Jesus and the outsiders who are harassing them. A battle of some sort going on. But it's also a battle that is thoroughgoing and explains absolutely everything in existence. At the top, it's a battle between God and Satan or the devil. And on earth, it's a battle between good people and bad rulers. And good people and bad people. It's a battle between good angels and bad angels. It's a thoroughgoing dualism that is characteristic of the apocalyptic worldview. There's a predetermined plan of God in the apocalyptic worldview, and there's a thoroughgoing dualism, a two-ism. There's good and bad, and everything can be fit into two, two categories. Good and evil. Just about everything that's happening could be understood in those two terms. This ongoing battle, an apocalyptic thinker thinks, between good and evil, will have an end. And that is part of God's plan, that this battle will end. And the battle will end with a big blowout battle, a final intervention of God, when God and the forces of good, God and his angels, will battle against Satan and Satan's angels, which will be replicated on the world between the good people and the bad people, And this battle will be finalized by God, and God will win. The final battle. But this idea of a final battle is common to Judeans who think apocalyptically long before you ever have Jesus. But not all Jews think apocalyptically. The Dead Sea sect do, and they think like this. And you've got a reading. Paul is another one that thinks this way. So you have the final battle. God's going to win. Wipe out evil, including Satan, forever. Sometimes it's obliteration for Satan and all the bad people. Sometimes it's constant torture for Satan and all the bad people. There's different scenarios. But there's an agreement that God wins, that God sets up a perfect, blissful kingdom where the good people will live forever. That's part of that apocalyptic worldview. That is not characteristic of all Jews. It's characteristic of the Jesus movement, most of the Jesus movement, including Paul. That concludes this episode. I hope you'll come again. In the meantime... You can.